Hello and welcome to Carnivorous Chats. My name is James, your host. I started this podcast to help other folks share their own healing stories and to interview thought leaders and experts in the carnivore, keto, and low oxalate space. Before we begin, I'd like to give a shout out to Equip Foods and the Carnivore Bar. As an affiliate, you can use the link in the show notes to get a discount on their products when you check out using the code Carnivorous. Thanks in advance for listening, subscribing, and any likes or shares. And now, on with the podcast. With that being said, Dr. Chafee, I really want, we'll do some rapid fire because I really do want to get to these mm-hmm. questions and make sure I, I'm honest yeah. with your time. The very first question that came across to me from a listener and a, and a fan of yours is, do you think that carnivore is then for everyone? I, I'm for every human, yeah. And so if you consider yourself among the the, the human species and the homo sapiens sapiens, then yes, I, I think so. You know, you, you won't find any examples in the wild of two members of the same species that have a different optimal diet right? You may find two different members that have, you know, more resistance to species inappropriate diets, like, like, you know, our European ancestors who had agriculture eight to 10,000 years ago, we've developed some resistances and ability to detoxify these things a little better than say the Native Americans, Sub-Saharan Africans, or um, Native Australians who get far sicker eating a so-called Western diet than Westerners. And this is something that we noticed for hundreds of years, that there were these so-called diseases of the West. And then people from the West would get these diseases. And now we're sort of doing that with dogs and cats. We're like, wow, we were getting these human diseases. Dogs don't get human diseases. Now they're getting human diseases. Well, when people started eating a Western diet, they started getting Western diseases. What does that mean? That means the food is causing the disease, you know, because when they don't eat the food, they don't get the disease. And we eat the food and we get the disease, we just get it at a lower rate, right? So that means we have some resistances, but it's not good for us. You know, if if you were less poisoned by lead than I was, that doesn't mean that lead's good for you. It just means that lead is less poisonous for you and it's not hormetic anyway. So all the members of our species will have the same optimal diet, just like there's the same optimal diet for dolphins and peregrine falcons and whales and elephants of that species like we are homo sapien sapiens we are we are very specific genetically we have been very similar genetically for the last 300,000 years we're very strongly genetically conserved in that time some changes but not all that much so yeah i think that this applies to everyone dr chavy just remind me how long have you been consistently carnivore for now that's a question from a listener as well they're just wondering most currently about 6 years just you know, nothing else. I started 23 years ago when I took cancer biology and learned how toxic plants were and how carcinogenic they were and how they had, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of carcinogens. And my professor was just like, yeah, you know, like I don't eat plants. I don't eat vegetables. I don't let my kids eat vegetables. Plants are trying to kill you. And I was like, right, forget plants. And I just stopped. And so I just went to the store and was just like, everything has plants in it. What the hell do I eat? And I just came across eggs and meat. And I was like, all right, eggs and meat it is and uh, and i ate that for a solid five six years um and then i was in the uk and and playing rugby uh there and and just you know some of the bread some of the the meat was sort of breaded had, had crumbs on it or whatever and i was like oh is that big a deal is it so much more convenient to buy this than than the other things and so uh, i just sort of convinced myself that it wasn't that big of a deal and and uh, it was a big deal it made a big difference in my in my health and performance and how i felt as an athlete and more importantly, it, it was the crack in the dam that now that I wasn't as strict, like I'm not eating any plants at all. Now I started eating a little more plants and a little more plants and a little more plants. Um, I never was a big processed food junk sort of eater. I always ate, uh, you know, mostly ate whole foods. I would normally cook myself and it was, it was predominantly meat. I always ate that. And so, you know, for the next sort of 10 years, I ate mostly meat with some vegetables and carbs, you know, sort of like whole food carbs that I would, uh, I would prepare myself mostly. And then for six years ago, when I came, you know, sort of saw Dr. Baker on Rogan and, and really realized like, no, wait, hold on. Biologically, we are carnivores as a species. That's just the kind of animal that we are. And, uh, and I was like, right. I knew it. I knew plants were trying to kill me, get rid of these stupid things. And I just stopped, I just stopped eating veggies and I started eating a lot more meat. I started adding in the fat because now the, the research had come out saying that fat was not bad for you. It was actually good for you. And uh, I felt I just like 
thousand times better than than I ever had, except for that period in my early twenties. Um, and so, uh, yeah. So, but but consistently six years, and it's I mean going on a hundred because I, I have no intention on going back on that, you know, unless I'm starving to death. And there's something people ask me too. It's like, you know, is it ever a good idea? Are there any plants that would be good to eat or a good idea to eat in any circumstance? And it's just like, yeah, if you're starving to death. It's a great idea, you know, but uh, apart from that, absolutely not. You know, I would not, I would not touch those things. And uh, I would encourage other people not to either. Uh, Dr. Chafee, another question is, I think the listener was uh, wondering, do you still salt all your meat and are you using salt currently? Uh, yeah, I, I use less and less salt as I go. I actually stopped using salt for about a month just to just to see because there are a lot of long-term carnivores that don't use any salt and they actually swear by it. They think that it that actually makes them even better. It gives them more health effects and benefits and they think that salt is, you know, A, unnecessary on a carnivore diet but actually, you know, detrimental that it can be sort of addictive and you, 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 uh, are sort of crave it and go after it. And, uh, I, I don't know about that, but, um, you know, it makes sense that we, we don't necessarily need to use it. There's a lot of populations alive right now that don't, don't use salt and live as carnivores and, um, and plenty of people, uh, you know, from, you know, uh, America and elsewhere that have been doing carnivore for decades and don't salt at all. So I don't think there's any any um, need to salt. You know, I don't think you have to on a carnivore diet. Um, I do just by preference, just because when I, I salt my meat, you know, I put it on like uh, drying racks and sort of dry it out a bit. And I find that the salt helps dry it out a bit, helps it brown better and uh, gives it a nice flavor. I was doing that without that and it, it worked fine, um, but I liked it just a little better with the salt. But I did it with like for a month without and I felt I felt great, you know. I don't think you need to use it. Um, I just do it just because of that that technique that I use. But um, yeah, you definitely don't need to. I don't think. For those folks mm-hmm. with low blood blood pressure, will carnivore make it worse? No, um, no, no. It should normalize things. It should make things better. It depends on what, what's causing your low blood pressure as well. That, that's usually abnormal. Like normally, people have a problem with high blood pressure, don't they? And, uh, and that comes from a number of different things or a number of different potential things. But a very common cause that we're seeing now is actually insulin insulin resistance. And so you know, just like you know, you can reverse diabetes, type 2 diabetes with a ketogenic diet, you know, which a carnivore diet is, uh, you can do the same with blood pressure. And so, you know, your insulin resistance is coming down, and now your your arteries and things like that are more uh expansatile. They can expand and contract in keeping with the volume of blood that you have. And so it doesn't just increase pressure because it can't increase the volume to lower the pressure. So that people find that they come off their, their high, you know, blood pressure medications pretty quickly, low blood pressure. There are, you know, less things that cause low blood pressure. Generally it's like, you know, you're hypovolemic, you know, you don't have enough water. You're very dehydrated. You've lost a lot of blood. There's something where you're, you're sort of, you're, you're losing fluid into other tissues, you know, you go into shock, you know, like septic shock where your body's sort of sequestering water out. It's leaving your vessels and your blood pressure drops, 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 because just all this water is going out and you're getting this insensible loss. And, and so, you know, that's, that's something that hopefully you're seeing a doctor about if you have low blood pressure, quite often it can be fixed with just more water. You know, quite often it's just a bit of dehydration or you get hypotensive uh, when you stand up too quickly. It's called postural hypotension. That quite often is from uh, dehydration as well, and sometimes it's just as we age, our, our vessels aren't as contract uh, as uh, compliant, and and you know we get these hardening of the of the vessels, uh, and that can also be helped with this sort of thing as well. And then the other other issue is if you're on too many medicate too many medications, you're on different medications that drop your blood pressure. Well, maybe you just don't need to be on as many. Uh, of those medications and you should talk to your doctor about, Hey, maybe I should come off of these things because I'm getting really dizzy and lightheaded. And, and especially if you go into a carnivore diet or any ketogenic diet, you probably will have to talk to your doctor about coming off medications like blood pressure medications, diabetes medications, certainly, and, and potentially other medications like psychiatric medications. You know, we've been using a ketogenic diet for a hundred years to treat epilepsy. And uh, now people are just rediscovering this because we've just papered over the past hundred years with pharmacology saying, ah, you know, it's easier just to, to prescribe a pill than to give somebody diet and lifestyle advice. And it's hard for people to stop eating carbs. Ooh, they just yell them, love them because it's so nummy. Okay. But you haven't tried. You haven't even tried to uh, tell people that there's an option besides taking 
medications that can cause harm and have side effects. And then a lot of people don't like taking. And every time I tell somebody, Hey, by the way, there's a ton of research that shows that, you know, a ketogenic diet can actually be really helpful. They go like, what, really? Like, wow, absolutely. I'm going to get all over that. They're, they're excited to hear that there's something that they can do to help their situation. Um, so like, like so many other things, once you start eating properly, and your body starts working properly, you don't need all these medications to sort of keep, you know, keep the wheels from falling off. So, you know, sometimes it can be too much. And so definitely be in touch with your doctor about lowering medications potentially if you need to. Excellent. Three more, sir. Then we'll wrap up. The next one is a, is very nuanced like that last one. And, and, and the lady was, you know, she's nervous and I understand why she messaged and asked if I could ask this for you. She said, she's a lean and small woman who started carnivore mm -hmm. nine months ago to help her gut issues. She's concerned about um, liver damage because her ferritin levels have gone up quite high. Should she stop carnivore for limit liver damage concerns? I need to know a lot more about her. Unfortunately, the, um, you, you don't normally see liver function tests go abnormal on, on a carnivore diet. So I, I need to know exactly what she's eating, what other medications she's on, what else she's doing, uh, and, and what else is, is in her environment. Yeah, it, when I take people's labs, like their liver function tests get better. They don't, they don't get worse. So, you know, something's happening. You can, you can take a look at, you know, I mean, she, if she, if her ferritin level is going crazy, um, ferritin can be an acute phase uh, re reactant as well. And so if somebody has, you know, increased inflammation or an infection or something else is going on, their ferritin can go up as well. So that needs to be addressed. That needs to be thought of, you know, maybe she has some sort of underlying condition that maybe can be, you know, showing its head at the moment, you know, just now, certainly with the, with the liver issues uh, that needs to be thought about. And so obviously see a doctor about that and, and get tested for, you know, uh, hemochromatosis and see if she uh, has that um, genetic variant. It's very abnormal for someone to run into problems like these just from not eating poison and eating what we're evolved to eat, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, whatever is happening is happening. So, you know, just try and see you know, check with your doctor to see what's going on. If your ferritin is getting too high and you need to transfuse or, you know, to, to, you know, to, uh, you know, give blood basically to lower your, your ferritin rate, then, you know, maybe you have to do that. Um, it could be that this is just sort of, uh, you know, hemochromatosis sort of, you know, rearing its ugly head. Um, I, you know, in speaking to Dr. Baker, you know, cause I don't, I don't treat hemochromatosis and it's rare enough that you don't really come across all that often. Dr. Baker is, you know, has collected, you know, over 12,000, you know, medical data and literature for over 12,000 pa patients uh, at Rivero Health. And, uh, and he's is, is getting more and more every day. And uh, he was saying that he's actually seen people with hemochromatosis who have to do bloodletting and, um, and uh, you, know, you know, give blood every, every few months to, to lower their iron levels, actually improve on a carnivore diet. So it's something metabolically, biochemically that's that's going a bit haywire in those in those circumstances with people that have that genetic predisposition um, that is causing them to to um, hold on to too much iron. So I, you know, it's it's tough to answer that question uh, wholly. Um, it is something I think she needs to see her doctor about and talk to because there could be something else going on. I don't I don't think there's any reason that a carnivore diet just just whole meat, fatty meat, and water, nothing else. Uh, would would cause the problems that she's having. So I, I would definitely encourage her to get something checked out. But I, I don't think that not eating poison is uh, causing these problems, which is what eating plants are. And I don't think that eating what she's biologically adapted and designed to eat is causing them either. Next one is an interesting one. The best way to build uh, muscle and what to eat before and after a workout, in your opinion? Um, well, from my, my experience and what I've noticed is that uh, it's much better to not eat anything uh, before working out, certainly before a big competition. If uh, you know, you're an athlete and you're doing some, some, or even, even, you know, taking a test, I mean, if you're, you know, you eat a whole bunch of whatever, you're going to divert a large amount of your blood supply to your intestines and digestive tract to break this stuff down. That, that's blood that's not available for your brain. And your and your muscles, so um, and it puts you in a rest and digest mode. It slows you down, makes you tired, and all that sort of stuff. So that's not a great thing to do before you work out. Um, so I always I always trained fasted. I always played uh, on an empty stomach. And I was always told people you always play hungry, you know, and that sort of like has that killer instinct. I need to go and you know, 
you know, like, you know, kill a gazelle and, you know, like beat a lion to death or something like that, or else I'm not going to eat. So you have that sort of, that sort of edge. And that's how I sort of thought about it. And that's sort of a funny way of thinking about it, but just physiologically, it, it, it makes sense to me as well that, you know, because you have all these different processes that happen after you eat and it's, then it's better to not do that. So um, just like anything else, you know, just eat meat, just drink water. And so I wouldn't eat anything before and afterwards, just eat meat. So, you know, I think, I, you know, there is evidence um, that that gets thrown around, you know, the sports, sports physiology and, and um, sports medicine circles that you have this anabolic window sort of 30 to 40 minutes after you work out. I haven't really looked too deeply into that research, but that's something I've been told by my sports medicine doctors and, and, um, and trainers for various different professional sports teams that I've played for. And they're, they're very much into that. So, you know, that may be the case. And so I wouldn't eat anything before. And if you're going to eat something after, I, I wouldn't waste your time with protein shakes and all that sort of stuff. You're going to, if you're just eating meat, you're going to get a ton of protein and uh, you're not going to get all the nasty sugars and sweeteners and artificial sweeteners and artificial ingredients that are going to come with it that you don't want. And so, yeah, so I would just, yeah, just eat, eat meat afterwards. If you're going to eat at all, that's usually what I do. And uh, the best way to build muscle is just working hard and eating a lot. So your hunger and your um, demand for food and nutrients are going to go up if you're working out, especially if you're working out at a high level, high performance level, and you're really pushing yourself, you're going to uh, increase the amount of food that you need to take. You may not be able to get those in at one time. So I find that, you know, just on a normal sedentary day where I'm just going to the hospital or the office and home, I eat about two pounds of fatty ribeye beef. And that seems to maintain my, you know, 230 pound frame. And when I'm working out and pushing myself, I double that. And so I'll have to eat twice a day. Normally I can just eat two pounds in one sitting and I'm great. Now like, Ooh, I sort of get two pounds, maybe a bit more three. And I'm just like, oh, okay, I'm stuffed. And then the next day I'm like, yep, yep. Actually I'm, I'm still hungry. I want to do something. And so I'll eat like, you know, another pound, pound and a half or something like that. And then that night I'll, I'll stuff myself again. And so I find that if I'm able to get the time to, to work out, which is not always the case, and I'm able to eat enough, I can put on weight extraordinarily easy. I mean, to the point that, that, I mean, most people hearing it, how quickly they would just be like, must be steroids. You know, it's not steroids. It's not TRT. It's not anything like that. It is just, it is, it is 100% diet. And I've never put on muscle faster, lean body mass faster than, than when I was, when I'm on a carnivore diet. And that's compared to myself as a, someone who's played high level, professional level of sports for years and years and years and years and years, for instance, during COVID, I couldn't I couldn't work out at all, and I only had time to work out sort of like a couple times a month, if I was if I was lucky, and um, you know I could have done more, but you know I just got into the routine of working, and you just you know I wasn't in the routine of working out. Then COVID hit, and I was just I was just like beside myself, I'm like no, no 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 that's not going to work for me. And now even though I was only working out once or twice a month, it was like I'm freaking out, like I have to I have to work out, and uh, and I was I was just pissed because I couldn't work out. So as soon as the gyms open, like I was there the first day they open, I got a new gym membership and I was there and I was like, right, I'm back on, I'm going to go back on my professional uh, schedule that I, my lifting schedule when I was, when I was playing rugby professionally and, uh, and I was just there and I was there at least four days a week, if not five or six and doing that and eating enough, eating till I was full and like until meat stopped tasting good. And doing that twice a day, I was able to go from, let's see, is it, I remember in kilos, but I was 102 kilos. And then I went up to, no, no, sorry. I was 90, I was 92 kilos and I went up to 105 kilos in five weeks. All right. So that's 25 pounds. So I put on 25 pounds of lean body mass and didn't, didn't put on any extra body fat in five weeks. And that's something like, that's impossible. You can't do it. Well, I did, you know? And so, you know, and, and uh, maybe that's because I have, you have a big frame and so weight goes on pretty easily. And, you know, maybe there's a bit of beginner gains because like I, I have the frame, I've been 270, I've been 275, mostly muscle. And, um, but, but definitely with that as well. Um, and, 
you know, so maybe it's easier for me to put muscle back on. I don't know. All I know is I put on 25 pounds of lean body mass in, in five weeks. And that's how I did it. How can folks that have that carb addiction curtail those cravings, curtail those carb cravings that are struggling? Well, I mean, you know, carbs can be addictive. Sugar or fructose is, is addictive. That gives a dopamine response to the addiction centers of your, of your brain, just like cocaine, heroin, and meth. And so this is a drug and we need to treat it as a drug. And just like a drug, you have to withdraw and you'll have cravings. But just like other drugs, you have withdrawals and cravings. They go away if you're able to, to if, if you're able to stay away from them. So for the first couple of weeks, you might have these these sorts of cravings, but you can temper them by just eating meat and just eating enough fatty meat. And if you're if you're satisfying your body's demand for nutrition, then you'll find that your cravings are much less. And sometimes, actually, because our our hunger signals are so much more subtle on a carnivore diet, because when you're eating carbs, it actually deranges your hunger signals. You know, you eat glu- glucose and uh, your blood sugar goes up. That makes your insulin go up and that, you know, insulin forces energy into cells. It doesn't allow it to come out of cells, right? So now you have to run on the sugars that you're eating as opposed to mobilizing your fat stores and making blood sugar and making glycogen and making ketones. But it does something more insidious than that, which is insulin blocks leptin, which is secreted from your fat stores that go to your brain and say how much fat you have, how much energy you have. And so now you're getting a signal that you have zero energy reserves because your insulin is blocking leptin and fructose also blocks leptin and your blood sugar is going down because insulin stays up. And so, you know, it stays up for about 24 hours and now your blood sugar is going down too low. And so your brain goes panic and says, Hey, we don't have any energy and our blood sugar is dropping. So we can't replenish it. And so if you don't eat, you're going to die. And this is why we go, Oh my God, I have to eat and panic eat. And you get these cravings, I have to eat, I have to eat, I have to eat. Uh, And we think of that as hunger. That's not hunger. That's a pathological starvation state where your brain thinks you're starving to death and, and you, and you feel like it. And that's, it's a horrible feeling. Um, I remember it. I, I do not remember it fondly. When I was first doing this 23 years ago, I had no idea about this. No one explained that to me. I had to figure all this stuff out for myself. And so I had no idea. I had no idea when I was hungry. I would, I would go three, four days without eating. So I was like, I, should, I, should, I really haven't eaten in a few days, but I'm, I'm not hungry. I, I'm not hungry. I don't feel hungry. But I was just like, okay, I haven't eaten in like three days or four days. I was like, I should probably eat something. And then I would eat, you know, a whole bunch of beef and eggs. And I'm like, this is amazing. And I just like devour it, um, you know? So I was definitely enjoying that, but I just did not feel hungry the way, the way I had in the rest of my life. So that can be carb cravings as well. If you get carb cravings, you're like, oh my God, I really want carbs. That could be your brain telling you, eat something, idiots, like let's go. And because that's how it knows to, to you know, that that's a, a, a hit of energy that it knows that it used to, to get in the past. And so you get that sort of craving. So anytime you get a craving, I would just think, okay, am I hungry? You know, does this, is my body telling me I need to eat? And just try eating meat. If you get cravings to eat something, eat something, but eat the right thing. Eat meat, eat eggs, drink water. And if they taste good, I think taste is a good marker of, of hunger because you get that positive feedback from, you know, uh, healthy meat and your body says, we want this. And, you know, the good thing about that is that your positive feedback is lower and lower, the less your body wants it. And then eventually your body says, no, we're good. And you'll get any positive feedback. And you just go like, mm, I'm not really enjoying this. I don't really want to eat this anymore. And you just stop. But as long as meat is tasting good, as long as you're not on eating carbs, and as long as you're not on medications that, that will artificially increase your hunger, I think that almost everybody can, can trust their hunger, can, can trust that signal. And so as long as meat tastes good, you can keep eating. And so I would say, you know, if you get, if you get, you know, eat enough so that you don't get cravings. And if you start getting carb cravings, then ask yourself if you're hungry, try eating. If meat tastes good, you're hungry, keep eating until it stops. And eventually they'll, they'll go away. Your brain will, you know, recognize that's not where we, we get energy. It's not where we want energy. And you'll, you'll get over the addiction to sugar and carbs. And you'll just, you, you won't have carb cravings again, unless you really under eat. And then you might, you might say like, mm, that bread smells amazing, you know, but you know, when I, I go through a bakery, you know, if I'm hungry and I go into a grocery store, I can smell the bread. I can smell the donuts. I'm like, Oh, those smell good. When I've eaten something, I go into a bakery. I can't even smell it. It's just, it's not registering. And I've noticed that I was, I was in Chicago with my cousin and his family. And they were going to a bakery and getting some, some treats and some, you know, sweet pastries and things like that. Couldn't smell it. 
could not smell a thing in there. And I was remember, I was just like, do these things just not have any odor? Like, why am I not smelling this stuff? And so I was like, yeah, no, it's there. But it just, it wasn't registering in my brain as anything my brain wanted anything to do with. And, you know, I think that that most will get there after a few weeks. So just stay strong and just, yeah, eat enough that you don't get cravings. Dr. Anthony Chafee, it has been an honor and a privilege, sir, to talk with you today. I've really enjoyed this conversation and I know my listeners will too. Thanks again, sir. Get some well-deserved rest and thank you again for taking the time out. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. And that's a wrap on this episode of Carnivorous Chats. If you've made it this far, I want to say thank you for listening and also thank you in advance for liking, subscribing, or sharing this episode. Thanks again to the good folks at Carnivore Bar and Equip Foods. Don't forget to check the link in the show notes to get a discount on their products. Until the next time, be well. <laughs>